Well, hello. Uh, you just give you a heads up. If you're talking at any point in time, I can't hear anything. So it's a weird position because like I might say something that I think is funny, but I will literally hear nothing. So um, hopefully, hopefully you find some sort of uh, humor in anything I'm going to say, but really um, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. So the title of the presentation is Embrace the Crack. And if you've taught changing voices, you understand where that's going. Uh, strategies for working with the changing voice. But first, a little information about myself. Uh, I am, I'm calling myself today the Crack Master. And of course, we have our Crack Mistress there as well. So I am the Crack Master. My name is Danny Gutierrez. I teach in Nixon, Missouri. Actually, right now in Minsk, I would be teaching men's choir, but I'm in a random room by myself. Hopefully no one comes in. And it's, there's, a, there's a decent chance that at some point I may have to move to my office because the battery is running low on my computer. Just giving you a heads up. It's nothing weird. And Crack Mistress? Hi, I'm Erin Plisco. I'm your Crack Mistress this afternoon. I'm the D Associate Director of Choral Studies at Missouri State University in Springfield, uh, just north of Danny. Um, this is my fourth year here, uh, but prior to teaching at Missouri State, I taught high school for a number of years in North Carolina, um, so I've worked with uh, voices of all ages. Um, just a little disclaimer for you all out there, um, Danny and I get a little carried away with the crack puns, um, so you're, you're in for a lot of fun this afternoon. Um, if you think of any really great crack puns that we haven't come up with yet, please email us. Um, because we we would love love some new ones. <laughs> if it's good enough, we'll put it in our next presentation. But we have high standards for crack puns. Like we literally text each other crack puns, and uh, that goes interesting. So, yeah. bah, bah, bah. let's uh, get on here. So, uh, the cracking questions I want you to think about. Uh, so, one: What is the physical function of a voice crack? Two. What are the most, uh, what is the most challenging aspect of working with changing voices? And three, what exercises do you use to enforce good registration? So issues to negotiate, just to put it all out there. One of the things are uh, identity, how you view yourself as a singer. So for instance, when I was in, um, when I was in sixth grade, I remember I had some weird issues with singing. Uh, I remember being in a class and, and my music teacher would always say, all right, use your head voice. And I had it in my head that head voice was not for me because obviously that was something for girls. So I remember I would never, ever do it. And I would feel ashamed about singing in the high voice, except one day I remember, I remember singing and then the teacher heard me and she said, oh, that's really good head voice. And I went, oh, okay, that's kind of right. But we're struggling with a lot of um, identity issues and someone, how someone sees themselves versus how they should be singing. So that's something to take into consideration. Uh, tying into that cultural cracking, culture and registration, um, our students come from diverse backgrounds um, and they're coming to us already um, with predetermined ideas of what is cool. Um, they're all watching different TV shows. They're listening to different artists. Um, and so they, they have an idea of what they think good singing sounds like um, and what what being cool sounds like, if, if that has a sound. Um, and so it's, it's our job to make them realize that accessing this slider mechanism is in fact cool. It's what all the cool kids are doing. Um, yeah, all, all the cool kids are using, uh, I don't wanna say it. Okay, moving, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, so there's so much media out there that we can use in the classroom um, to achieve this, to demonstrate to students um, that this is actually something that they can and should be doing. Um, so finding videos of their cultural icons um, embracing the crack and then and then showing that to them. So I have a couple examples here for you that I'll share quickly. Um, these are, examples are a little dated. I'm a child of the 90s, um, but you all are much more hip and in tune with your students, I'm sure. Um, so you can find uh, videos of people that are more relevant for them. Um, and also uh, TikTok, which again, I'm, I'm not in, I'm not a TikToker, um, not very TikTok literate, but that's another source, just endless, endless videos that you can use in your classroom. And I know Danny's going to share a TikTok plug with you later, but here we are. Um, some examples. The first is, uh, we're going back. This is Sam Smith and Justin Timberlake. <laughs> The 
second example here. We won't listen to too much as Usher. Okay. Not the most appropriate song, but uh, so uh, just examples, examples of, of popular music um, of people that your students might look up to or um, feel like they identify with um, that you can play in your classroom. Um, so, so other issues to negotiate, social issues. Um, this is something we face at all levels, regardless of what level you teach. Um, our singers are coming in with insecurities and self-consciousness. Um, the voice is a part of their body, and it's very scary to share that with others. We know this. Um, students are afraid of embarrassing or humiliating themselves. And it's very difficult for a lot of them to overcome that fear and really put themselves out there. Um, so it's it's important that we create this cracking culture um, that allows them to feel safe. So it's all about normalizing mistakes and normalizing yes. making strange sorry making strange sounds, um, so that they feel safe to engage in an exploration of their voice. Um, I always tell my students better a bold mistake than a timid correct. So we're all about celebrating bold mistakes and and strange sounds. Amen. Amen. So I know in my, I know in my case, one of the things that we do, so immediately whenever someone's in the classroom, let's say they, they do have a vocal crack, they kind of normalize it. We actually affirm it. We go the opposite way. So um, someone has a voice crack uh, and they have this like look of shame initially, then I'll make it a point, especially in the beginning of the year, I go right up to them and say, oh my gosh, that was a great crack. Your cracking is exceptional. I'll give them a high five. And I do that every time. And sometimes I'll give them points. If it's like a really good one, I'll give it 500 points. If it's like a little one, we'll give it, you know, 50 points or something. And then after a while, you know, the students are giving each other high five for doing that stuff. And I think that's really important because you have to think about like when you want, when your voice is about to crack, what do you do? A lot of people will prevent it from cracking by making excess strain, but really we'll get into it more later. Cracking is just a way to protect yourself. Um, so just kind of making it the culture, like it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to crack. Yeah, and we're gonna talk more about ways to normalize those phenomenon in your classroom. Um, but another video here for you, that's one of them. Uh, if this fam famous tenor can crack as epically as he does in this video here, um, then everyone else can. Um, I always show this video to my students. Um, and I think the more that we create opportunities for our students to make these sounds, and to feel silly and to laugh, which they're all important things. We don't want to take ourselves too seriously. And um, then the more uh, we normalize these sounds and instances so that when it does happen accidentally, um, it's totally normal and students aren't embarrassed. Um, and we certainly never want them to feel embarrassed about their bodies. So here is our, our epic voice crack that always gets a good laugh from the students. <laughs> And it makes me laugh every time. It's so good. Love it. Love it. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so and then to, to tag on to the end of this, uh, just other issues to negotiate talking um, habits, but talking being the biggest of those um, students are coming to us with habits ingrained uh, with regard to how they speak. So we're often working against those habits in the classroom. Um, a lot of these habits will have to do with um, over pressurization of the heavy mechanism or vocal fry. Um, and then that can pose a lot of difficulties when we're tr dealing with uh, registration. Our students don't often think about how they talk, um, so they won't necessarily know that they have problem problematic speaking habits. Um, I know a lot of students, and I don't know if this is a cultural, culturally relevant thing anymore, um, but the Kardashians, for example, um, a, a lot of uh, young women think that it's cool to talk like this and somehow it's just become a thing um which <laughs> so gross uh but but they come in thinking that that's just how they're supposed to be talking um and that's just just another thing that we have to deal with when we're when we're teaching registration true all right so the next point you ready dr pliss you have to say it without this is this is one of our jokes we try to say the titles of the point without without smiling or laughing. I hope you've been practicing. I expect big things. Ready? Yes. Look directly in the camera. Say it without okay. smiling. The root of the crack. I still <laughs> smile. It's okay. Anyway, moving on. Why, do, why, why, does, why does my voice crack? That's, that's a good question, Dr. Dr. P. 
Um, sorry for calling you Dr. P. I've never called you that before. That was weird. Sorry, my bad. Um, so what's happening here is that uh, there's a new coordination happening. So a lot, you, you definitely experience it um, with males often. Their, their voice box goes from the size of like a pecan to a size of a walnut. So that's a significant growth. A lot of the growth is in the thyroid arytenoid cartilage. Um, when that happens, the, the TA ligaments kind of take over or the thyroid retinoid ligaments, which control uh, the lower voice and because it favors it and you're also talking in it, it kind of shoots down there. Um, so the goal is almost like a rehab. It's almost teaching a new coordination that happens. So we're trying to make it so that there's balance in the, equa in the equation instead of just uh, dominating uh, with the TA. Danny, can you just explain for us what is physically happening when the voice cracks? Oh, sure. So the reason why your voice is cracking, so when you're when you're singing, I guess, in chest voice, if you want to call it, you're using predominantly the entire cord in vocalizing. Um, when you're switching into the lighter mechanism, there's more of a pull from the CT or the upper, the, the, the part of the cord that is related to the upper voice. So, um, so what's happening is when you sing high enough, with the entire cord vibrating, um, your body's like, uh-uh, don't, don't go go there, girlfriend. And it cracks to kind of just get it into this healthier spot, just using predominantly the upper part. It's a, it's a way to protect your vocal cords from, from very, very intense frequencies um, that are happening. And can you explain for us as well what the thyroarytenoid and the cricothyroid, what those two are responsible for? Yeah, you have all these questions, Dr. Dr. Plisko. Uh, so I would make I would make a chart, but there's no way I could, where I can draw it, and also it'd be awkward because of, if you've seen vocal cords, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have the thyroid arytenoid ligaments. Let's make it this creepy looking spider looking thing. Uh, your or sorry, thyroid arytenoid, cricothyroid, and they're just like pulling. Does that answer your question? You said what do they do? So thyroid arytenoid pulls like the entire cord and there's a lot of there's a lot of movement in the entire cord when you're doing that and that's primarily um, that's primarily what you're using when you sing lower and the ct is what you're using higher so the goal is to just make it a little more balanced and develop that coordination okay cool. is that the, uh, the benefits of crack yes you did it again without laughing good job <laughs> Uh, benefits of crack. As we all know, there are a lot of benefits of crack, right? Sorry, we get we carried away with the jokes. Um, so one benefit is that it protects the voice. It makes it so that um, you're not you're not taking those 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 vibrations and frequencies too high, which is causing damage or potential just overuse to the vocal cords. Yeah. Likewise, having access to the slider mechanism increases your student's range. As, as you would expect. Uh, warmth and sound, so the balance, the overtone from the higher, uh, from the higher vocalese helps, helps um, kind of round out the tone or, or make it warmer. Also helps to create laryngeal stability as a result of this balance, this TACT balance, it helps uh, alleviate excess tension, which is always good. <laughs> Also, it helps, uh, it, it embraces the lighter mechanism, the lighter mechanism, which it's easier to sing, more relaxed. And, and this, all this stuff is connected, laryngeal stability, the lighter mechanism, um, increased range, it all comes from the same stuff. So crack, everyone is doing it. Um, so now we're gonna talk through some strategies for embracing the crack, things you can do in your classroom to get your students to um, embrace the letter mechanism and beyond embracing it um, to consistently reinforce and apply to repertoire. All right, ready? Quick game. We're going to come up with words saying the same, saying the same thing, the cracked voice, and we're going to come up with different terms that you may or may not use depending on what you fancy. You ready? So who ready. Right over you go first. You can go first. Okay. Crack. Head voice. Lighter mechanism. Um, Falsetto. Floating voice. Uh, head voice. Warm voice. Um, Mrs. Doubtfire voice. <laughs> Lifted voice. Tall voice. Yawn voice. High voice. Julia Child's voice. Okay, so yeah. You get the point. Yeah, you get the point. Thanks for moving it on. 
Yodeling time. Okay, so, yeah, so uh, well, really quick backing up. So the importance uh, of us doing that game is is just um, to establish terminology with your students. Everyone refers to things differently. Uh, we all have our own our own terms that we use in our classroom. Uh, the key, that, however, is just to be consistent so that when you refer to something, your students know exactly what you're talking about. And here we go. Next one. So first, uh, first crack crack technique. Uh, we have the yodeling. So um, because it's awkward and, and you know, we'll, we'll sing something, uh, we would advise you to do it. And actually, if you do it, do it loudly so others can enjoy this too. Uh, so let's practice the first one. One of the things I like to do is I make to, like to make a clear distinction between chest voice and head voice, and I do it through yodeling exercise. So I'll leave a pause in case you guys want to echo me or Aaron can do it. You can do it with her. So I'll sing, you sing it back. Hey. And I like that approach. So it's heavy chest on the bottom and you're going to the E valve. So it's the more closed valve, which helps you lock into that position. And one more time, Aaron. I hear you. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Little lolly, so the whole thing goes a a o o little lolly. I'm thinking I'm singing the wrong pitches, but that's the point. It's going from o to u and a to e to fill that switch over in mechanism. Then the little old lolly you at the end, uh, and it's really effective and it's fun to sing for students. Cool. More yodeling uh, or intentionally cracking. This is one of my favorite things to do with my students. It's also one of my favorite things to do myself as a singer. Um, it, it teaches uh, how to use the crack to your advantage. It teaches a very clear distinction between the two registers for your students. It helps establish that laryngeal stability. It's, it's like a laryngeal massage. Um, I use this myself whenever I'm singing and I feel like I need to hit the vocal reset button um, and like get my larynx out of my forehead and put it back where it's supposed to be. Um, and it works with students of all ages and ability levels. Um, it really helps to bring the energy and uh, breath pressure of the heavy mechanism into the light. And then most importantly, it's it's all about normalizing the phenomenon. So all of these, these exercises we're doing with you, um, the more you get your students to do it, then, then the less awkward they feel when it just happens naturally. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, share with you a exercise that I do with my own students. So starting in the, in the chest and then flipping up to, into the head, I'll demonstrate and then we can do it together. So, Oh, 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 oh. Um, the importance that the key here with this exercise is making sure that as you go up, you're moving through the crack and then you're cracking back down. Um, students will try to finesse the register shift. Oh, 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 oh. Um, but the purpose of the exercise is in fact to move through uh, that shift, that register, register shift that occurs and to, to purposefully crack. So let's try that together. We'll just do it uh, at a couple different pitches and oh, and then here, oh, <laughs> and people will giggle because it's fun. Um, if you have students who are, are finding it difficult to intentionally or to purposefully move through that crack, uh, a way to get them to do that is to to glissando or slide up through the register shift. So, oh, <laughs> and then it'll just happen, um, and it's and it's lovely. Five hundred points. That was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, this this uh, ensures that that they're not using that they're not over pressurizing and that they have a consistent breath pressure um, and and not too much tension. So that's a fun exercise. So for your advanced. Uh, advanced singers, <laughs> um, some some extra cracking if, if you're looking for a challenge, Re reverse yodeling. And we're gonna try this together as well. And then you can take it home and practice. Um, so this is starting in the lighter mechanism and then cracking up into the heavy and then alternating. So light, heavy, light, heavy. Um, and, and so I'll demonstrate for you and then we'll try it together. And I'm gonna try not to laugh while I do this. So. <laughs> Woo. Um, so it, so it's, it's, it's difficult to start in the light and then crack up into the heavy. So we'll try this together slowly. 
So we start with, wait, we start with head voice, not yep. with, not with chest voice, right? Yep. Yep. You start light and then you crack up into the heavy and then you alternate. So we'll try this slowly starting and, uh, e <laughs> and it's lovely. Uh, your students who are really into folk music uh, and, and some other uh, more popular popular types of music will will particularly enjoy enjoy that exercise. Um, so again, it's just all about negotiating those register shifts. Um, top down vocalizing. Uh, so I'm a strong advocate of beginning each rehearsal or, or vocalizing session um, from the top, uh, from a higher pitch and then working down. So bringing the lighter mechanism down into the heavy versus bringing the heavy up, um, which can sometimes lead to a press sound or excess tension with, with less experienced singers. Um, my altos want to belt. They want to like sing everything like full out, full on chest voice. Um, and so starting rehearsal, somewhere up top and then bringing that, that lighter mechanism down reminds them that this other register exists and it's actually quite nice. Um, uh, and this works for, for all voice types. So I'll, for example, um, start a rehearsal and I'll have my tenors and basses sing in the same octave as the sopranos and altos. And we'll stop or we'll start up high and then we'll just move quickly so they don't have a chance uh, to think too much about it. They're, they're not overanalyzing, it's just this this transition is just hap happening. So, for example, and then we'll we'll quickly move down. Um, I'll, I'll use this as well if uh, tenors and basses, let's say, are struggling to find a, a healthy registration in a higher pitch. Let's say like a middle C or a, the D above middle C. Um, then I'll take them, you know, a fifth or a sixth above that pitch, and we'll start in the. We'll start there and then we'll just quickly move down until we land at that that trouble spot. So then they've just naturally arrived at a healthy registration by starting um, starting higher and then coming down versus trying to approach it from that lower, heavier place. So something to consider, too. Um, so if anyone has experience teaching uh, middle school students or beginning high school students, a lot of times like the student will favor, especially the male student will favor the lower register so much that you could go higher and higher. And sometimes they'll just go, uh, higher. Uh, like if you're doing a descending in, uh, exercise, uh, now go higher. Uh, I'll go higher. Uh, and they'll just make these groaning sounds at you over and over. Um, one of the things that I, so what that is, is just really favoring the lower mechanism. Uh, so one things we'll, one of the things we'll do is we'll have this challenge, right? So who can, not necessarily who can crack the highest, almost like who can crack the lowest, and how low can you bring that voice all the way down? So they'll start off like, oh, oh, and there'll be a big gap. So what I teach students is kind of lighten when you get to that point and see if you can bring it all the way down. Oh, so it becomes more seamless. And just, just that shift, I think, does, does everything. Some, some guys, I've realized, are incapable of singing in tune, which is a very, like, like uh, with a very intense chest sound. So it's either finding mix, and actually, I don't know if you found this to be the case, too, but some guys that I know, they can, they can sing in tune super high in their falsetto, but they, even though their voice is completely changed, they can't sing it down low. It's because it's, it's completely void of any of the CT that's needed in their lower voice. So it's just bridging that gap on the way down. I like that. So so you're basically having them start in their, their head voice and then seeing who can take it the lowest. All, all the way, all the way down. And what happens naturally is it mixes, but if, you, if you're if you subtle with, uh, if it's a very smooth crack, if you will, it'll really, um, it'll refine the tone quite a bit. Another exercise that I do is, um, of course, the old school Italian Mesa di voce. The Mesa di voce is often confused. You know, I've heard some people say it's it's a it's a term of dynamic. When you see crescendo and decrescendo in the music, that's Mesa di voce, but really it's not. Mesa di voce uh, in Italian means measure of the voice or placement of the voice, if you will. It's to teach position positioning and balance within registers. Um, so Mesa di voce is you take a vowel on a note and you crescendo and decrescendo, keeping the integrity of that first tone. So an example would be Ooh. 
at first it's going to be a lot of or like you're going to have to work on that initial placement and that's key and once you do that i kind of so we work descending so eventually they're going with the lighter mechanism or like let's say keeping that sound connected to that lighter mechanism and growing it without, you know, the temptation for a lot of singers at any level will be as they get louder to go and get into this overly chesty register. So it kind of teaches, if you're very particular about the practice, teaching that, that good registration. Sirens. Uh, we all love sirens. We all do sirens. Um, it's important to, to remember uh, to have a purpose for doing them, of course. Um, so uh, we love sirens because they help teach and reinforce phonation in the lighter mechanism. Um, and it's a great way to get students who are reluctant to access that mechanism to experience it. Um, the big thing to remember, however, is to, to, to remember to connect those to these concepts to the repertoire. Um, so I love sirens for reminding my students um, of how, how easy singing actually is, because often our students just overthink um, and they, they do so much more than they need to because they think I'm singing now. Um, and, and as a result, they're using uh, muscles they don't need to use and, and we get all the attention. Um, so for, for example, when my sopranos look at a, a piece, a measure in a piece of music and they see like a G or an A and they freak out because they're like, oh my gosh, it's high. I have to sing a high note. And then we'll say, well, oh, here sopranos, like we just did these sirens do this. Woo! And then they'll go, woo! And then we'll go, woo! And then we'll just connect the siren to a sustained pitch in a seamless way, uh, just to force them to realize that there is essentially no difference between this, woo, which they do all the time and they, they find to be quite easy. And then the sustained pitch in that, in that same range. Um, and it just helps them realize like, oh, I can do this. And it, it actually isn't, I'm making this so much more difficult than it needs to be. Um, it works great with tenors and basses as well. Um, I have a, a community choir here at Missouri State and my tenors and basses, even, even the, the, the adults, they're so reluctant to, to use that uh, lighter mechanism. So we'll, we'll, I'll say, good morning, Coral Union. Well, I won't say good morning because they meet in the evening, but <laughs> you get the point. And my tenors and basses will say, good evening. And we'll say, woo, and they'll respond, woo. Um, so, so it's it's really just about finding tricks, ways to trick them into into that mechanism. And then the, the more frequently that we we trick them into doing this, um, uh, then the, the more consistently they're able to find that mechanism. So I like to get them to sneeze. Um, so I'll say, everyone, ha choo, and they'll they'll make the sneeze sound. Um, so then it's connecting that that phonation that they they do when they sneeze to then something more sustained. I love that. Um, one of the, another exercise I'll do involving sirens is, is kind of taking multiple approaches on how I want students to sing high notes and, and what type of uh, timbre I want them to use. So we'll go, for instance, on a siren from an ah to an ooh, so they really feel that flip in there, um, then back down to a ga, so we can kind of feel the flip out of it too. So um, we'll go, oh, and I teach them there's a few ways to approach that, the auga. So they can use more of a detached head voice sound. So like, auga, or auga, that's a little more attached. Um, and depending on the repertoire you're doing, you kind of need to know both. Uh, so I would say, you know, for, for one of my choirs, if we're doing more like Eric Whitaker, we're probably going to use more of a detached head voice sound rather than Mozart. It's going to be a little more attached uh, for the stylistic needs of the music. Okay, um, next one. Oh, one of my favorites. I have warmed up classes with this so much. It's something I call Wanda voice. Wanda voice might be interchangeable with like uh, missed out fire voice, Julia Child's voice, whatever analogy you want to use. It's using this, you know, this kind of really lifted voice. I remember um, just working middle school class after middle school class after middle school class, just teaching them to do that. And then what we do is we transfer the Wanda voice to actual singing. And I'll say, I want you to literally, literally use the Wanda voice. Not literally like, like, you're literally a taco. I mean, like if I said you're literally a taco, you would literally be a taco in the same way. 
literally use the Wanda voice when you're singing. So, um, so this is this is an activity uh, that I do with students a lot. We'll just have like random conversations, and normally I'll say you can talk about whatever you want as long as it doesn't get me fired. Um, just have at it, have a great conversation, or I'll give them something structured. So, uh, Dr. Plisko, Aaron, let's have a conversation with Wanda voice. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So let's think about it. Let's do the let's so do the old cat and dog routine, Aaron. So you'll be uh, why don't you be because we did it we did it different the other day. Let's have you be the dog, and I'll be the cat, and we'll make our arguments for who is the superior animal. But you'll use just Wanda voice. Got it? Okay. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Woofy. Nice, nice to see you today. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm always great. I'm a dog. I'm happy all the time. How are you, Meow? Uh, you know, cats are cats are pretty happy too. I, I'm just pointing that out. Um, also, I I do want to give you a compliment though. I really think you have a nice lighter mechanism. It's a very nice lighter mechanism. I know it's a very advanced term for a cat, but I think it's lovely. Although in no way, shape, or form as superior as my mechanism is. What do you think about that? Why? Thank you. Oh yeah, sure, no problem. And a lot of times, uh, singers will they'll want to um, they want to like close it off like this, and this isn't quite Wanda. This is more like you know Mickey Mouse, or they'll want to go the opposite extreme, like there's like Batman, which is not it either. It's this lifted, nice tone, and they can have a lot of fun with it, and it really does teach them. And if you go, I promise you, I challenge you, do that. Go from Wanda, Wanda voice, you call whatever you want, you call it Fred Bird voice for all it matters. Use your Frederick voice and then immediately transfer that into singing. You'll see a huge difference. Love that. Love the wand of voice. Um, moving on, cracking the shell. Uh, so this is a call and response exercise I like to do, uh, especially at the beginning of, of the year or if it's at the beginning of rehearsal with uh, students I'm, I don't know very well. Um, and it's all about tricking them into making register shifts. Um, it's also about normalizing making mistakes by getting them to make strange sounds. Uh, lots of strange sounds from the very beginning. Uh, my students always think I'm crazy when we first do this, and I'll see them looking around the classroom uh, to make sure that other people are making the weird noises with them. Um, but if you do this enough after a while, it just becomes such a normal occurrence that there is no there is no such thing as a weird weird sound. Um, and it just makes makes it a much safer place for them. Um, so we'll do this little exercise and know that you can do this with with whatever sound effects you want and forever. However long as, you need so we'll do call and response. I'll start and then you'll reply and we'll just carry. Let me through. do it. I'll do it. Yeah, do it. So we'll have. So you get the idea. Um, so so it's uh, it's uh, getting them to do a bunch of other things. Of course, they're following the conductor. Um, it's all in time, which is impossible to do with awkward Zoom. So you get this weird delay, which is fun. Um, uh, but but it's just call and response, and and you can throw in all sorts of tricky rhythms and all sorts of sounds, uh, just to encourage them to to explore their voices and all of the things that it's capable of. Um. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go through the next points pretty quickly because we want to make sure we're ending kind of on time and we also want to make sure you have time to crackle with Lynn Gackle. Oh, snap. You proud of me, Aaron? I said it. I said I was going to say it. Crackle with Lynn Gackle. I came up with that one. It was just a moment of brilliance. I don't know. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, find vocal models, find brave souls that don't mind singing in front of people who can demonstrate these type of sounds that you want to hear. Uh, use your colleagues, like I've brought in Aaron uh, to my classroom to show students uh, some sounds that I can't make and give some illustrations examples to get into that, that mechanism. Um, learn to sing loudly, right? So a lot of times you're in a situation where you have five, uh, five bass or tenors in your choir, you have a ton of sopranos and altos, and you kind of look at the bass and tenors and you think, more sound and you go like this more when they go ah. so you have to learn to sing loudly uh singing loud really is a is more of a it has to be an acoustical thing 
uh, if you're singing correctly and technically with good acoustical formation, you're going to make the sound that's desired. Um, also, another one I have here. Uh, what is the new point that I said? What is the new point called again? The changed point. The one that was oh, using using the crack to sing higher. Using the cracked voice to sing higher. I omitted a few words from that, so we changed it. Um, using the cracked voice to sing higher. Um, one, I, I have a TikTok. If you if you're ever into TikTok, check it out. Um, it's Mr. Danny Gutierrez. It's on TikTok. I talk a lot about cracking and stuff. I just started it, so but it's fun. My latest video was of um, a student's reaction to cracking versus my reaction to them cracking. So the student goes, oh, say, can you see? They're like, oh my gosh. And then, and then I go, yes, yes, now crack on pitch. But it's true, uh, learning to use that cracked voice to kind of hit those notes, that's the way to do it, because otherwise you're just gonna have excess tension. So using using the crack, so to speak, to really hit the pitch is is often the best solution because it's the most relaxed solution and the healthiest solution for the student. Yeah, I, and I want to go back really quick, Danny, to you were when you were talking about um, learning to sing loudly and and making sure that uh, until technique is established that that loud singing can be detrimental to good registration. Um, because we all find ourselves in this real weird oh, weird weird world right now, uh, the, the pandemic where a lot of us are wearing masks and a lot of our students are singing with masks on, uh, which just exacerbates everything we, we've been talking about, um, but particularly particularly um, them being timid or you feeling like they're not singing out enough. Um, so we have these students who are orally cut off from their classmates. They're only hearing themselves. Um, and for a variety of reasons, they're just not making as much sound as they're as they might normally. And so that as conductors, we're like, more, more, more. Um, and so that that's just another another thing that factors into this conversation here in 2021. <laughs> 2021? All right. So uh, that's pretty much our crackitation presentation. How would you combine presentation and crack together? What would that be, Erin? Oh, I don't know if I've had enough coffee. That's pretty much, you know, <laughs> that's pretty much our crackulation. Um, we're going to open it up for like three minutes. If you have any specific questions you have for us or. And if uh, we, we've put our email addresses at the top of the handout, uh, we both have just like an endless supply of, of fun exercises uh, to do in the classroom. Um, and maybe if we had like five hours, we could have gotten through them all. But if you have any questions about anything we've talked about or, or anything else, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we like talking to people. <laughs> It's fun. Okay. Hello. And I think you're muted. I'm Hi. Not oh, Hello. Can you hear me now? Sort of, like very faintly. Okay. There. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> My question is, do you have a specific range or area that you start these exercises in for the middle school boys? Uh, so my, the, the, I want to get the nearest frame of reference for the student. Uh, the nearest frame of reference will be a year or two before when their voice was um, when their voice was a lot higher. So I try to find ways to access that. And there's a really a lot of really interesting like voice changes that I've noticed over time. You have the some that are like slow and nice and natural. Then you have some like I've literally had students that sound like they have two different voices in one person. They'll go ah, uh, ah, uh, and it's like something completely different. But I like to just find that higher register and slowly find ways to bring it down. And I like to find it quite high. So I'll normally go up to maybe like, um, I'll take it to like an E flat or an E, Ooh, if they can. So if they can, you have to become creative and find other ways to do it. But most, I would say, I would say most guys actually are capable of doing that if they're specifically instructed what to do and how to do it they'll be able to access it. For those that can't, you have to be a little more clever um, and find something else that works, but I'll take my high. And progressively lower if we can once, uh, like, like I said, I have some students that cannot match pitch lower, but they can match pitch higher. So I kind of find what they can do well and take it from there. And no matter what that is, and that will change based on the student that you're working with. Yeah, I, I agree. I generally tend to start on the top end of the treble staff. Um, so never above the staff, like right at the beginning, but like like around that D, E area, right? And, and ho you're hoping before you get into into various passaggio, passaggi. <laughs> okay, cool. Veronica. 
Go. Uh, my question is, what advice do you have to um, help a student who perhaps has not yet been able to access their crack and like they're like, I, I don't have a falsetto, it doesn't exist. Uh, what advice do you have to, to help them access it? Uh, yeah, so I would say, and Aaron would probably agree too, so making it so that it, it's not a singing issue, that it's more of a sound thing rather than a singing thing. Like, um, if you, you know, if, if I tell a student, hey, you're going to sing this and sing it well, they'll get stressed. But if I say, hey, make a fart noise, then they'll be like, oh my gosh, what an honor. I'm going to like own this fart noise and they'll do it. Or whatever noise I ask them to do. If I ask them to do a silly noise, they'll do it. So it's kind of making this concept of singing and the concept of like singing high or singing low and singing on pitch and just making it to have a different sort of real life application for them. So finding uh, some way to bridge the gap, whether it's sound, a noise, and and some something so just find something that they can do and replicate that resembles it and then kind of moving it so that it has more to do with pitch eventually okay um, oh <laughs> hi um so you're saying physiologically the break or the crack occurs because of tension yes there's that, like that, a relaxed relax voice it gets too tight it breaks and then there's a relaxed voice up high so yeah, so it's you're saying? like um, if I were to show, it's like if this is an entire vocal cord. Right. So what happens is you go up to a certain amount, you go up to a certain pitch, and then what's happening is they're 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 vibrating very intensely, and then what happens is the weight kind of comes off, and you can feel it when your voice crack cracks too. The weight kind of comes off of it, and what that is is the, the lower half of the cord kind of relaxing a bit. Um, as the as the thyroid arytenoid or less less engaged, and it's kind of the CT taking over there, and it allows you to get higher without the the amount of uh, the amount of uh, I guess amplitude that's that's normally happening. Okay, my question is like, why why would you not just relax the voice to get it to go up without breaking, if it's tension? Sorry, can you say that one more time? We're trying to process what you're saying. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. So if tension is causing it to break. Why would you not just relax the voice on the way, on the way up so it wouldn't break? Aaron, do you want to tackle that one? Well, for, for a lot of us, and this, I, I'm in this boat myself, my, my chest voice, my, my light, heavy mechanism um, can only go so high. Um, and so as I, as I reach that, that point to where that register shift happens, um, that's where that tension starts creeping in. Um, so this, this, the, the whole concept of a crack, it's not saying like, this is how you should sing all the time. We're not advocating that when you sing, like perform your repertoire, that your, your students should be, <laughs> should be making that sound. Like if there's a register shift in a piece of repertoire, we certainly don't want to hear that when they're performing. Um, this is merely a tool, uh, just, just one little tool to help them explore these register shifts um, and to, uh, explore where those register shifts happen. And then from this point, then you can move forward into then learning how to finesse those register transitions. Um, but this is just, just a tool in your toolbox to, to, help, um, to help teach the difference between the two. Um, and then of course, to, to help make our students responsible for their voices in a way so that when they feel that tension, um, they know what's happening. Um, and then they have tools uh, with which they can alleviate that tension. Yeah, so like, like for like, I think for like a lot of refined singers, you can often say, okay, now now relax the voice, and then they'll they'll show the desired result, I guess. Um, but for a lot of but for a lot of people, like if I told a middle like a lot of middle school boys, okay, relax. Sometimes the same result will keep happening. It's lower, out of tune, just kind of almost feels like random notes, and um, and so yeah, like like Aaron said, it's a tool to kind of mix things together. The ultimate goal is a seamless. The seamless registration, right? Both voices combined. So it's just a way to kind of help out the CT part of it. Yeah, consistency throughout the range. Um, and then and just healthy free singing. Um, so this is just one like little small chunk of the pie that can help us get our students to achieve that because we know that uh, our students all respond differently to to different uh, different methods. Um, so this is just another one. <laughs> Aaron, I think it's time for them to crackle with Lynn Gackle. Doesn't it seem like that's the case? It does. Yes, but don't go because I have a question. Okay. Would you say that the pun is the highest form of humor or the lowest form of humor? 
But um, but uh, all right. Thank you so much, Daniel and Aaron. Good. Yes, yes. Yay. Thank you so much. You are amazing. This has been incredible, and I'll follow you on TikTok. All right. Nice. Oh. And now it's my job to introduce Lynn Gackle, and I left. Oh, I didn't. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, and we did that. So now, <laughs> now we get to hear from Dr. Lynn Gackle, who is an amazing human, and she is the director of Coral Activities at Baylor. She has served as president of ACDA, the the national ACDA president of yes, and. Um, she has taught at the University of South Florida, Univers University of Mississippi, and the University of Miami. Um, what I, um, how I discovered Lynn Gackle is that she came to ISU and hosted, uh, and was the clinician for the Idaho State University Choral Festival when I happened to be singing there. And then when I started teaching, I found her book about Finding Ophelia's Voice, Opening Ophelia's Heart, which changed my game um, when, it, when, when I needed to have information about teaching young women. So um, without further ado, Dr. Lynn Gackle. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I, I love I love that um, little crackle with gackle. Y'all know how often I get that name. That you know, my husband gave me this name, and, and I'm stuck with it. And I get this, uh, this these funny puns all the time with that name. But um, yeah, crackling with gackle. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I wish I could be there in person. What a beautiful! I'm, I get to see the room there. It's lovely there. Um, and I, I've listened to the past few minutes, uh, probably about the last thirty minutes of uh, your the previous discussions and I couldn't agree more so many of the ideas that they're using that they've said you know they use with men's with boys voices um, actually you know that top-down thing is something that I've always used with girls and we really do want that balance between registers um, I think that's a it's a difficult thing if we start in that lower register and flipping over if you want to say flip uh, basically it's just giving way one one set of muscles to the other it is the thought arytenoid muscle, the vo the, that is the same muscle, that, that's the vocal folds. But it's those external uh, muscles that the CT does, it just flips over, you know, and it's it's balancing that. And um, that's that's the goal of what we do in voice training. And so I find that you're right, that, uh, that top down really, really does help. Um, I'm going to talk about this, uh, this female voice thing, uh, which, which I love to do. And I'm going to see if I can share my screen with you um, and I want to be able to share my sound and be sure I've got everything marked here slides as virtual no I don't want to slide as virtual um, hopefully that won't well maybe it will I don't know all right we'll see what this happens um, let me try to share here no you don't see that okay um, let me go back okay Okay, can y'all see this? Yes. yes, no, maybe? Yes. I'm hoping. If I can't get, do I get any feedback here? Can somebody give me a hands up? Can you see this on the screen or no? Okay, you can. Thank you. So I'll play it from the start. There we go. Awesome. Um, understand the adolescent female voice um, is something I, I've spent about four decades doing this, um, and I sort of fell into it because uh, I was working with a, with a choir that I'll talk about a little bit more, um, but I think that the my interest in this young voice, is, uh, it really has spanned all these decades, and I, I do love working with girls' voices, and um, I think part of that has to do with the fact that I myself is a, am a French horn player because when I was in junior high, I was told in seventh grade, oh, sweetie, your voice is a little too breathy, and I couldn't sing in choir. That stuck with me a long, long time. And um, sometimes I even wonder now, uh, am I okay? Because, it, you know, when you're told something like that at that age, you're, you sort of feel like maybe something's really not right with you. Um, and I've, I've learned there's probably a lot not right with me. But nonetheless, um, that was something that really I loved singing and not to be able to do that was, was, was kind of sad for me, quite frankly. And uh, I wanted so much to, to do that. But I played piano and I could read music and I love French. 
French horn, actually. So, um, but I, I realized at that time and, and subsequently that um, the person who told me that, um, bless her heart, at that point in time in the dark ages back all those years ago, they really didn't have much, much information on female voices. So basically she could just say, well, it's breathy and no, you're not going to do this. <laughs> so anyway. Um, I think that this young voice for both males and females does present a challenge. And for a long time, it was because of lack of knowledge about vocal development. We do know a lot more about that now than we did when I was in, at LSU, for instance, in the 70s. Um, there was one book by by Erwin Cooper, and it was called Teaching the Junior High Voice. It was like a Bible, you know, it was thick and, 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 uh, but, there was a lot of information because uh, the Cambiata Press and the whole concept of Cambiata singing and John Cooksey's work. Uh, John was a student of Irwin Cooper's at F FSU the, back in those those days, and uh, so there was a there was information happening about the male changing voice. But I mean, maybe a paragraph or two about female voice. It just it was sort of like it just didn't happen. So a lot of uh, I think working with my students now, I have a a, a choral literature class, choral pedagogy class. Uh, for those that will go out and teach, some of them are instrumentalists, some are vocalists, uh, most other, all of them are vocalists, but those instrumentalists really don't understand the development of the voice and they don't have much experience with it. And even those that are singers, for the males, it's kind of interesting to talk to them. What do you remember about voice change, you know? And they all of a sudden have to flip and start thinking of, of what they're doing from a teacher standpoint, likewise with girls. And, and, and that's, that's kind of a, a of a big switch for some of us, but very few of us have the opportunity to really have had a lot of experience. I think that we finally end up growing and learning from our students. They teach us a lot more than what we come in perhaps knowing. So um, just a little bit of the past 70 years, uh, you know, males changing voice as has come under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of a lot of things have been done with that uh, with regard to stages of maturation and characteristics of each stage and methods of voice classification and I have to tell you that I do come down on the side of before we can really address and and help develop the voice we have to know the voice we have to know what's happening what's changing and then how we can deal with that as far as the vocal technique aspect we're the only voice teachers that a lot of students will ever see. So from a developmental standpoint, we really have to know how the voice works, what's going on with it. And in adolescence, a lot of changes are happening because the the whole reality is that voice change is a secondary sex characteristic. And uh, you didn't see that in print until about 1990s, believe that or not, but it's true. Um, we also know that children are maturing earlier and earlier, so it's not unusual to see changing voices happening at fifth grade and sixth grade, not just at junior high. And so I think that's something that we always have to keep in the back of our uh, of our minds. The sequence of change doesn't really, you know, the sequences that, for instance, Cooksey has described, or even the ones that I've sort of described with girls' voices, I, I still find that they happen, but they're happening a little bit earlier and earlier, where it used to be maybe a seventh grader or a sixth grader. Now it's kind of a fifth grader and a sixth grader because of that maturation happening earlier. Um, strategies for teaching, and of course you've just listened to some, some wonderful strategies, and, 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 and I think that um, that's what, you know, our, our literature, our music uh, is our textbook. So finding pedagogically sound pieces that we can teach voice from and, and really help them as that voice is going through stages of development is so important. And then lastly, just the psychological ramifications um, of the boy's voice, yes, but of the girl's voice too. Oftentimes girls, girls feel like maybe something's wrong with them, very much like I did. Um, they, they also have voice cracking, if you wish, or breaking. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very embarrassing thing to, to have to deal with, actually. So I, I know that, um, I know that, that personally, and I, I think that if we can do anything besides maybe the most important thing is the fact that we will maybe help students to understand that they're not broken that this is a this is a stage and it's a unique stage and there's nothing wrong with it it's very normal in fact and though they maybe had sung at one, you know, as a child in the upper registers and things like that, and the voice was pure and, and, and the range was dependable, 
It's not so much now, but that's not always going to be the case. And to realize that this too will change and this too is normal, I think is really important. And that might be the most important thing that we can do is to help them accept who they are for where they are at that time. Um, Perhaps we all need to do that. I think John Cooksey um, is somebody that I've, I've always admired. Um, he, his research is uh, it's probably the most notable with regard to males' voices. And, and I have to say that I do talk about this because um, I, I, John and I got, the I got the opportunity to work with him. But we worked together through the Voice Care Network back in the 1990s. And we both learned a lot from each other and from the students that we got to work with. Um, John published a landmark studies uh, um, in, the, in the 80s. He did a whole sequence of choral journal articles. If you don't know about them, they're in 19. 1977 and 1978, and it was a four-part series, and the information is still so worthy and so viable. But he based his longitudinal study, which was an inter interdisciplinary study, um, on um, a, some work that was done in Germany in the 1960s, and that was done by Daniel Weiss. And it identified five stages of development, Weiss did, and indeed, Cooksey took that information and sort of played it out, if you will, or reestablished it, it uh, established it in California uh, with an otolaryngologist, um, a speech pathologist, an uh, adolescent pedi an adolescent uh, stage pediatrician, worked with adolescents. I don't think they were adolescent pediatricians, but nonetheless, you know what I'm saying. And so um, they did identify those five stages of voice change, the unchanged, of course, but then the mid-voice one, mid-voice two, two A, mu baritone, developing baritone. And of course, the two and the two A was really sort of very similar to Dr. Cooper's concept of the cambiata voice, which was um, literally just simply meant changing. And um, of course, uh, three-part mixed music, I'm old enough to remember when three-part mixed music came into being and a person named Joyce Eiler started writing this up in Oregon and all of a sudden junior high teachers go oh my gosh look they understand we've got we've got a part just for those guys that are like F to G and uh, or, or G up to uh, to D uh, around middle C G below and up to D and it's not very much of a, of a range but it was written just for that voice part so um, that's that's awesome the fact of the matter is that um, we often have more female singers in our classes than males, but and often girls don't experience the dramatic voice change symptoms as do males. So um, I have to tell you that early on it was really felt that girls' voices don't change. Now, if you can believe that, I remember doing my first session on adolescent voice at um, at the MENC convention in, in 1982, 84, excuse me, and. Um, I actually had somebody take me to task on it. A gentleman came up, he says, you know, girls' voices really just don't change. They're trouble voices. I said, yes, they're trouble voices, but if you've ever heard Kathleen Battle and you just heard the nine-year-old that I had sing on stage, um, the Charles Davidson, I never saw another butterfly. I said, did you hear a difference? <laughs> and that was probably a smart aleck thing to do, but you know, that was my point. Yeah, it's a trouble voice, but listen to the differences. And of course, we get to work with those differences. The other fact is, you know, as far as being a collegiate teacher, as, a, as opposed to a junior high teacher or an elementary teacher, you know what? We're, we're still teaching this changing voice. Even at the university level, that, that human voice does not really mature until the mid-20s. And so I'm working with changing voices. Those freshmen come in, they're just high school seniors, quite frankly. And some of them, uh, vocally, are even less mature than that, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> I just find that um, you know, it's, it's a fact that often girls are, are, are there's more of them in the group. <clears throat> and yet they're left sitting as the teacher works with the male voices and tries to get you know them on task or helping them to learn to negotiate some of the the, the challenges vocally. Um, as far as our, our ensembles go, uh, have y'all noticed that our pinnacle ensembles still tend to be mixed ensembles? Um, and I think that's interesting, quite frankly. I, I love mixed ensembles. However, um, the treble ensemble and, and, and even the lower voice um, 
ensembles, male ensembles, or just LTB ensembles, often are sort of left over to the side, and they're kind of the redheaded stepsisters. I think that's unfortunate. And I say that only because only as it, because we as a profession um, kind of encourage that sort of uh, discrimination, if you will, against these ensembles. So I, I do think that that is beginning to change, though, and I think that's really, really important. Um, I've alluded to this already, but as I said, comparatively little study had been devoted to the adolescent female voice. And so in 1984, I was working with a, a group out of Miami. I had been with that group uh, about five years and they had sung at an ACDA conference and it, I, was, I was kind of pleased with what I was hearing, but I sent a, a, a tape uh, that shows you how long ago that was. Um, I sent a recording for consideration and it was the Miami Girl Choir. And basically I had ages nine up to about 13 or 14 in that group. Um, I requested a performance slot, and uh, what I got back was a letter saying, yes, we would like a 30-minute concert and a 45-minute demonstration regarding female changing voice. And I thought, oh, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, that was not in the cards. I, I, I really was not expecting that, quite frankly. And so I called up that Mr. John Cooksey. It was Dr. John Cooksey even then. I had not worked with him at that point. And I said, you don't know me, but my name is Lynn Huff Gackle at the time. And I said, I'm supposed to do this workshop and I know of your work. And I really would love to know whatever you know about female changing voice. And I was very surprised to have John respond. Well, you know, the young lady, I don't know very much about that at all, but I'm always asked about it. So I encourage you to study it. <laughs> well, that, that kind of wasn't what I was looking for, <laughs> but, um, as I said, I, I was kind of working by the seat of my pants, but then I began to read John's information. It seemed methodical to me. And indeed, as we worked together, we found a lot of commonalities. Um, I just went backwards there, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, as we were working together at the Voice Care Network, we um, started talking one day about the symptoms of change and what those voices were dealing with and what was happening really. The Voice Care Network also went into a lot of detail with regard to vocal pedagogy and how the voice actually worked. And I've listed this as symptoms of voice change, but it was very interesting as John uh, and I discussed it, he said, man, there's so many of the commonalities between these two voices. Um, both show in a decreased and inconsistent range. And I, I had a handout and I don't know if it got passed out or not, but there's actually actually spaces on the handout for this. Um, but nonetheless, decreased in inconsistent range. All of a sudden, that little voice that was so fluty and, and that child voice that had such access, um, sort of those top notes don't come so easily anymore. Um, likewise with the male voice, it's kind of like, oops, what's happening? Where am I going here? You know, um, Both voices demonstrate uh, or exhibit huskiness and breathiness. I mean, I guess anybody that's ever worked with junior high sound under understands that one of the aspects of working with junior high voices is that it's breathy and there's a huskiness of tone. I think that sort of goes along with it, but I do have to say that I think that a lot of the huskiness and breathiness that we hear is inefficient use of the voice. And what we can do to, to help that sound uh, through breath management exercises, onset, um, placement of tone, um, working with resonance, a vowel unification, um, all of that can, is stuff that we can do as choral directors through, through warm-ups, through literature. And so some of that breathiness is definitely um, innate in the young voice because of the growth that is occurring there. We'll talk about that in a minute. But some of it is just poor or inefficient use of the, of, the, of the breath, especially. And so we can work with that. Voice breaks and voice cracking. We've been talking about that. Um, obvious transition notes, the appearance of the passaging, um, and, and that would be the register changes. And, and so if you listen to child voice, you don't hear them so well. You, they're not as clear. They're not as distinct. But as the voice begins to change in both males and females, we do see a little bit of, 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 of a passaggio at the, a passaggio at the, at the F and the G for the girls. That's the first one I noted. And the other one is the adult passaggio at the top of the staff, which kind of stays with most, most sopranos, um, in, in their lives, in their lifetime. So the appearance of that register, if you will, not so noticeable with child voices, but it's probably still there, obviously, but it's just not as, as perceptible, I think. 
Also, the lowering of the speaking voice. We certainly hear the octave phenomenon with male voices, but we also see a, a lowering of the female voice, too, uh, as much as about a third to a fourth. The average uh, speaking pitch for most women is about an A flat before, below middle C. Some of us, as we get older, and we use our voices inappropriately, and lower that even. But nonetheless, that is another characteristic. Um, insecurity of pitch, the in, in, inability to sing into the center of a note. I also liken this if you've ever um, sung a, a piece in uh, the key of F and have trouble keeping it in tune, but if you raise it one half step, or even a whole step sometimes, because again, we're working around those voice breaks or those passage areas. And so knowing where those are uh, helps us to be able to sing a little bit more securely into the center of pitch. And of course, difficult phonation with girls' voices, um, except, uh, you know, there are chimes throughout the, the menstrual cycle that we have uh, the, the edema, which, which is just retention of fluid. Uh, that also happens in the vocal folds and causes huskiness and inability to cleanly uh, duct the vocal folds. Uh, so that difficult phonation does occur um, in both male but especially female voices. And then no so noticeable changes in, in tone quality. Some girls have a pretty clear sound all the way through. Others, such as myself, other girls that I've worked with, um, at that age, uh, I, my voice was very, very breathy. And if, if you're cognitive, cognizant of this placement of where those breathy and more pure voices are within the ensemble can yield a totally different sound of your group. And I love to do this workshop where I actually have kids that I can work with because I'll put all the sort of pure, more pure sounds in one area and all the breathy sounds in the other area and it's really unbalanced. But if I began to sort of Put them, I work on the premise that like voices repel and unlike voices attract. It yields a wonderful acoustic effect, and it's very, very smooth. I use this with all state choirs. I use it with all choirs, quite frankly, and it works very well because it's, fi it's finding where voices reinforce each other. And so that's, to me, that's really important. So I came up with a framework um, based on my work uh, with, with the female voice. Uh, I did give that, that little session. I ended up writing an article for the Choral Journal in 1984, just kind of it off, didn't know what in the world I was doing, quite frankly. Um, but I sent it off, and unbeknownst to me, um, about six or seven years later, I had no idea, but that had actually been printed. <laughs> Those stages had been printed in textbooks and in choral methods books. Now, y'all, it wasn't because it was a great piece of research. <laughs> it was totally experiential. It was based on what I had been dealing with over a period of years. I did, through my doctorate and my master's degree, get to extend that. I have still yet to do a longitudinal study because I've come over to the dark side, and I only do performance here at Baylor. But there is research that has been and is ongoing with regard to female changing voice. And so knowing that there was such a need at the time, it was not great research, but there was nothing written about this voice up to this point literally it was always 1984 since that time we have had a lot more writing about it and a lot more interest in this young voice and that thrills me quite frankly and if you're interested in it I encourage you do the longitudinal study take the time to do that you do you have it every year when you work with your students but the phases that I have talked about are start start with phase one which is a pre pubertal and it sort of has an analogy or an, it is analogous to that mid voice one a little bit phase uh, 2a it is pre menarchial um, and then, of course, and, and, and we do know, since this is a secondary sex characteristic, the voice change, there is a linkage and there has been some research done on the pre- and post-monarchial voice in, in, in the 1970s. Um, Duffy, it was not music ed research, but rather speech research, found that there was a difference as much as a, as a minor third, um, a difference from the 13-year-old pre-monarchial voice. It was a little bit higher 
speaking voice than the 13 year old post monarchial voice. So um, I think that 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 the onset administration does have something to do with it. And it makes sense because of the the hormonal involvement that's that that, that takes place during this time. Um, phase 2B is the post monarchial ages and I put the ages there. Ages are not reliable, not for boys voices, not for girls voices, um, because quite frankly, everybody's different. And so we do know that the ages are getting uh, younger and younger at which each one of the phases starts. Um, but as far as we're all unique individuals and everybody changes at a different rate. And then the phase three is the young adult. I, I, I put that note there that chronological ages are just guidelines. They're general and they're not reliable from that standpoint. So what's really happening at this point in this workshop, I usually do a whole thing on vocal pedagogy um, based on what's really happening with the voice um, and, and the actuator, the vibrator and the resonator, because those are important things. Every single aspect of that instrument changes during this time. So with the laryngeal growth, um, upon ex examination of the adolescent male voice and female voice and the various laryngees for each, um, the growth in the female laryng uh, larynx is more of an increase in height, whereas the male is more of an increase in posterior anterior, which makes sense because as, as Danny just said, it is more of the growth of that, of that thyroid cartilage or the Adam's apple, and that is where the vocal folds actually lie. So it accommodates the lengthening of the folds or the cords themselves. Those folds or bands increase in females from three to four millimeters, and in males, um, they increase up to one centimeter. And in addition to the change in thickness, and both of them change in thickness. Now, it sounds like a whole lot, but it really isn't. And it's such a small, small. I, I'm amazed at this organ of the body, quite frankly, because it's so delicate and it, it's, it's a, it is so tied, I think, um, when we speak. It's a very personal thing. The voice is a very intimate thing. I think that's what I love about teaching voice. And I, even though I love wind ensemble, um, teaching voice where the instrument is inside of us and everything that affects us psychologically and emotionally does affect this, this little instrument right here. I think that's amazing. I don't think it's by chance that this lies between here and here. I think that everything that comes through in our vocal, in our vocal, whether it's speech or song, is affected by what's in our heart and in our mind. I think that's divine. And I think God did that myself. But anyway, the huskiness and breathiness of both voices is due to a little gap. It was actually first found in the 1800s, believe it or not. Um, and it's very typical of singers whose voices are changing. It was um, it represents a weakness in the interarytenoid muscles. And um, basically, that's that innate breathiness that, that we find in changing voices. It's the sound of, of a, a, a clear voice, but it's accompanied with a little wild whistle rustling of air. William Bernard talks about this. Now, Bernard called it the mutational chink, the mutational triangle, or now I think we're calling it mutational gap. But basically, it is the characteristic sound of breathiness in young voices. And um, the normal exercise of the voice and, and the maturity strengthens the arytenoid muscles and it empowers the voice. Um, I don't think that young singers should be encouraged to eliminate breathiness. This is that, that's, this is a growth factor for, for, for young people. But I, as I said earlier, I do think that we can work on onset. We can work on um, management of the breath and all of that done within the context of the music, which is phrase. So during adolescence, there's also so increased breath capacity due to the lengthening of the vocal tract and the increased circumference of the chest. Thus, you have increased lung capacity. It's going to be a different instrument. There's more power there. Um, the resonating cavities also change during adolescence. The larynx tends to descend slightly, thus lengthening the pharyngeal tube. The development of the space in the sinus cavities and the facial structures all result in a perceived timbral difference uh, or changes in the voice. And I think the combination of the breath capacity and these resonating cavities also result and what we hear as greater voice power of that nine from the nine year old voice to that 16 year old voice to that 25 year old voice.
The hormonal secretions at the onset of puberty result in the growth of pubic hair, of, of facial hair in boys, skeletal growth, as, rel as well as breast development. Breast development is termed as thalarchy, the onset of menstruation, and this, is, this has not changed. This is a sequence of, of adolescent growth. Uh, thalarchy typically occurs about two years before the onset of menstruation. So breast budding might start two years before the onset of menstruation, and that breast breast budding sort of coincides with that stage one um, and 2A um, or, or phase one and phase 2A that I've, I've identified. Now, obviously, we can't ask our students these things, but we have eyes and we can see. And I, I know that my, I have a, a 10 year old granddaughter and uh, she is five foot six, believe that or not. Uh, she is of mixed race and she um, has a, a, a breathy quality to the voice. Um, and so I know that even in fifth grade, I'm hearing changes, I'm seeing changes in this child that um, I'm sure that you have noticed with your own students. And I think to recognize those changes and changes and to anticipate some of the things that vocally go along with that is really important. Now, I just squeezed a whole lot of stuff in a, in a very short time, but I do think it's important to know what is happening. Um, you know, comparing the male voice and the, and the, and the female voice at, at this time is, is uh, I kind of liken it to, uh, I'm kind of a, a visual person. The change of the boy's voice is kind of like the changes of the color spectrum. Whereas the girl's voice, it truly is a treble voice. But if you can imagine with me here, just a second, and you have a, um, a, a two children behind a screen, one boy, one girl, you don't know which is which. If you heard them both sing, they're both about seven years old, you'd be hard pressed to hear the differences in their voices. They're child voices, they're very similar. However, as that boy goes through a development, that voice goes, through, if they're both sort of a light blue, if you will assign a color to it, the male voice change, light blue, dark blue, green, I mean, it goes like this, the changes of color spectrum because it's no longer a treble voice. It's something totally different. However, with the girl's voice, it's sort of a, the, the shades of change. It's still, the shade is still blue. But it starts light blue and medium blue and dark or a navy, and we have this rich timbral difference, I think, with, uh, with girls' voices. And so I don't know if that helps any of you, but in listening to girls' voices, it is a shade of change difference than it so much of the of the of the uh, change of color it is it's a it's a timbral change uh, lighter to to more rich or however you want to say it um this is a comparison and normally i have a handout with this too but it just encapsulates exactly what i just told you the, there is laryngeal growth male and female voices one is a little bit different from the other the lower terminal pitch for the male voice lowers about an octave and for for the upper terminal pitch, it lowers about a six. Dr. Cooksey used to call that the slinky. It was like a slinky that goes down the stairs. Well, the top kind of goes over the bottom and, and it sort of goes and from, from that treble sound all the way to that through that octave phenomenon. In the girl's voice, we have a the lower terminal pitch lowers about a third and the top ultimately will rise. So even though the voice maybe sort of condenses a little bit during voice, voice change, as that voice develops, we now have a more extension on the top as well as the bottom. And the, the, I'll, I'll just say this real quickly because I don't want to forget it. Um, you know, God didn't make too many contraltos and altos. I mean, they really didn't. The population, if we think of a bell curve, most females tend to be mezzo-sopranos. You will have extremes on both ends, but those extremes to me come later as one is more mature vocally. Um, so I think our, our challenge begins to, to select literature that continues to exercise the voice. I like equal voice literature to start with. And then listening for those timbral changes, if someone is, if a girl is, is more comfortable singing in the alto range, I'm gonna judiciously select that music and not have her on low Gs and Fs the whole time. Um, but I'm gonna also maybe move her to a second soprano if you're doing three part music. This is why listening and then placing on the voice part 
is so important. Knowing where they are and then allowing them to be placed where they're going to have the greatest success is so important. Resonance. Both of these voices lack resonance and are, have a huskiness and breathiness of sound. Um, in the range, it lowers and decreases a little bit, oh, and but ultimately it, it increases again. The tessitura, that comfortable singing range, sort of fluctuates in both voices both voices. Register development, both voices. We hear that. We hear that appearance of the falsetta. We hear that uh, that, that adult passaggio in, as the girls' voices continue to expand. Um, and of course, quality changes dramatically. Um, I don't mean quality as in good and bad. I mean quality as of tone quality changes. And the girls' voice changes mostly in, in weight and color timbre. And then both have vocal instability. It's kind of difficult. You know, as those guys are changing and into that new baritone stage, they have what closely called blind spots. Those blind spots are places around middle C and, and a B around uh, low, lower than middle C. Uh, those are notes, some of, some of those boys can't even sing sometimes. And I found something analogous to that with girls because around that, that little first passage, if they, if they, if they find, if they have that around the F and the G, They'll, they'll, they're fine in chest voice. It is the crack, quite frankly. But around that portion, it's really hard for them to make any sound there of substance. So putting them in a range that has them asking, asking them to sing in that range constantly, how frustrating can that possibly be? So finding where they are and helping them to understand, okay, I need to make this change here, but I'm going to select literature that makes that helps them to sound the very best that they can at that particular point. So it's important to know um, that voice classification that I'm talking about is not soprano, alto, tenor, bass, but rather according to uh, vocal development. And then we can assign that uh, to either an SATB or an SSA or an SAT or whatever, three-part mixed, what, whatever the situation may be. Vocal development leads to the appropriate voice part. All right, so we're going to listen a little bit. I'm looking, let me look at my tone. Oh, I'm almost out of time here. So we'll listen through uh, to some of these. And um, there is another handout, and I don't know if you got it or not, but it's, it basically outlines the characteristics of these various um, various changes. So this is phase one. This is the uh, a little 10-year-old, and hopefully you can hear this. Um, here we go. The age of this student is 10.9 years. Did you all hear that? I hope so. If you can't, please somebody say something to beautiful. me. Beautiful. It was beautiful. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. So the Hackle, SFF, I'm sorry? You have about eight minutes. Okay. So uh, clear flute-like quality, SFF, just let me say, is speaking fundamental frequency. So that's about a middle C. Let's go on then. The age of this student. Oh, there we go. Next one. The age of this student is 11.8 years. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ah.
So you hear a little bit of breathiness. The range is still the same, but you hear a little bit more weight of this sound. I would put this voice singing soprano one or soprano two, wherever they're most comfortable. Um, but there's a little bit of, of struggle at the top of the range that you probably can hear there. The age of this dude. All right. Ne oh, come on. Here we go. This student is 13.4 years of age, post-monarchial. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good. Now, I think that's a good example of, of somebody who's been singing a lot of alto. Talk about embrace the crack. Yes, what you hear is that little passaggio, that register change, which is very apparent. I think it's really apparent because this person has been singing primarily in the alto range and not at all in the upper register. I would think a better voice part for her might be soprano two and certainly working top down so that that maneuvering over that break would be a little bit easier for for her. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm rushing through here. So let, me, let me go on. All right. This student is 14.2 years of age, post monarchial. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh, oh. So you definitely hear there's some struggling at the top of that register, but you see a much more uh, even continuum. You also hear a little bit of vibrata coming into this sound, but the breathiness is not nearly as noticeable um, in this voice. And so this really is a combination of phase 2B and kind of phase 3, and I just wanted you to be able to hear this that. And this is, uh, I'm sorry about that. Here's the final stage. This student is 15.5 years of age. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now, I'll hasten to say that this is not an adult voice. This is, a, it is past the high point of change. Where to place this voice? Well, it depends on the choir. You could place this voice on a soprano too. You could probably have her even sing a little bit of alto as long as it's not too low and keeping her in that range. You could put her in the top soprano part. Um, it can be moved around and I use this in treble voices uh, as color. And so this is a more, uh, more mature voice that I can position wherever I want to or need to within the within the choir and I think that's really important to know. Just do um, going on and I'm almost done here. Criteria for classification.
communication. That speaking fundamental frequency is very important. Finding out where they speak. Now, I never, those are not vocal easy folks. Those are not. That's just for me to hear where the changes are and to assess the voice. So this, I'll have them count backwards from 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and you sort of hear a pitch in the middle, and that becomes the speaking fundamental frequency. And I know that that speaking fundamental frequency for most is about a major third above the lowest terminal pitch, the lowest usable pitch. We'll put it that way. They might can go lower, but you wouldn't want to sing it, hear it much. Um, so finding that speaking voice is really, really important. Now, a lot of people will, or a lot of kids will go, 10. Nine, eight, seven. They'll. Do. I'll say, speak to that corner of the room over there, and that will increase the the pitch just a little bit because they put it on the breath. And it goes back to what Aaron was saying earlier about just talking like the Kardashians. I, I'll have to use that next time um, because it's it's just something that they're not used to doing. Um, so finding where that pitch is. I don't go one, two three, because you'll be hard pressed to get the average speaking pitch from that. But if you go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, they have, they sort of do it on their own. The vocal range, the next thing I'm going to do is go through the range, find out what their highest, the upper terminal pitch is, and the lower terminal pitch. Then I'll start at the bottom and I'll find where those passaggi are. Ah, 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 there's the other one. And so forth. And I began to note those. Uh, the first one is found mostly that I've I've been able to discern mostly in those that first phase of change, and that more mature or the the later phase of change that's phase three. Then we hear more of the one at the top, and of course voice quality, and that's the pure birth is the breathiness, and that's really important because you can have a very breathy sound and be a freshman in college. Now where I'm going to put you in the ensemble within that section, that's something that I will play with a little bit. And with hopefully with breath management exercises and emphasis on resonance, etc., I can improve that and help them to improve that as well. So as a quick summary, age is not an, a reliable factor. Voice change is gradual. And a sequence of change is predictable. And that's occurring earlier and earlier, but the sequence itself still remains the same. Just a word to note, um, Joanne Rutkowski reproduced a John Cooksey study uh, about 10 years after the fact, and she found that those stages of development did hold true, but they were occurring one year earlier. And so we do have some research on that. Listening to individuals for reclassification is imperative. And if you can do that once or twice a semester, that's awesome. If you can't, just once a semester. Avoid labeling. You know, the little girl that says, um, you know, I say, well, what part do you sing? Well, I'm an alto. Really? Um, and I say, do you play piano? And they go, yeah. And now I know why you're an alto, because you can read. And so we all need those readers. But have them... Um, Try to have them not not label themselves as soprano or alto. I mean, most of them, if you're going to label them anything, they're mostly sopranos who can sing an alto part or sing a second soprano part, whatever. And then, of course, I do like to alternate um, my voice parts for the girls. In other words, I don't want that first soprano always to sing the top line. I want her to increase her musical ear and her own musicianship by moving it into the second soprano sometime. And I used to have some first sopranos that say, please, let me sing the alto part. I just love alto. And they would, I'd, I'd move them down. As long as it doesn't fatigue them, they learn how to negotiate between between the, the registers and know what to do. But that becomes our job as the voice teacher, if you will, to help them understand how to do that. Um, if you need to contact me, this is my email address. It's Lynn underscore, you can't see my underscore, Lynn underscore Gackle at Baylor. Or I have a Gmail account, and that is my cell phone. And um, if you're interested, um, uh, finding Ophelia's voice, opening Ophelia's heart. Um, in the final analysis, folks, what we do with young people is so important um, from the standpoint of having them accept who they are, uh, recognizing that they can express themselves in song all of their lives, and to encourage lifelong singing. Um, I think that's the most important thing. And the more I, I do this business, and, and I, I just had my 66th birthday the other day, and I have to tell you that um, it's the music is all is the medium. I've always said that I taught music up until a few years ago, and now I truly say I teach people, but my medium is music. And so we teach the heart, we teach the mind, 
um, and our tool is the music. Thank you so much for letting me be here today. I enjoyed being with you. Dr. Gackle, we do have just a couple of minutes for questions. If you have a couple of minutes to answer a few questions oh, from I'm, our participants. I'm here the rest of the afternoon. It's Friday. All right. Oh, awesome. And happy birthday. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Oh, and ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gackle, I didn't have a chance to look at the handouts, but if, if your contact information is in the handouts, um, the handouts were sent to you just as the session was beginning. So they were. But I can resend if you didn't get it. Um, okay, so if we have questions, we'll run microphones to you. Can, doc, can we have Dr. Gackle's face back on the screen? We miss her face. Please? Oh, yeah, I need to stop sharing. Oh, sorry. sorry. Here we go with the first question, Dr. Gackle. Okay. Hello. So as somebody myself who has struggled with my upper passaggio so much and negotiating that, do you have any suggestions or exercises for young women who are really struggling between that upper passaggio? Because sometimes it's really tiring to do exercises up there. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we've already talked about the side glides and things like that. Um, I, I utilize with, with my women, um, uh, and I do have a, I have, it's half majors, half non-majors. I, I have them vocalize in both directions. Um, and uh, as far as that, v -v 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 I utilize that all the way up to the, even to the point where it, it, it might sound a little brittle, but I want them to bring resonance into to the tone. The other thing is um, having them understand the lift. Lift is key for, for women's voices. And I, I, I mean, is, especially in Western music, unless you're doing something from another country and you want to use a different total, total different production. But one thing that helped me is to put the hand right here, sing a country E and go E, and then have them understand that this is what's happening inside um, with lifting of the soft palate. So E, and when I found that and they understood lift, it will change the whole sound of your choir. And um, I don't know if that speaks directly to to the to the accessing of that, but I think that the the and having them slide because half of it is connecting with the breath. We have trouble and I think we get tense because we think, oh, that's high. And we pull back with the breath or we tense up here. So what can we do to maintain that energy, that breath flow and have the resonance, the forward placement, have that connection and of course we can change with the ah or whatever but those are things that I found have been just game changers uh, for for tone from for my groups at least thank you other questions we didn't have time to get your contact information in that last slide <laughs> And I'd really okay. like to take a picture of it if you could. Put yeah, it let me. Um, I'll I'll share screen again, and um, let me just back up here. Boom. Oh, I can't. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, mm, let me try this. I'm gonna do this, and I'll um, play from current slide. How's that? Can you see it? I yes, ma'am. I did that in a funky color. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm looking at your big screen there and I'm like, oh, I can't even read that. So it's L-Y-N-N-E -N underscore Gackle, G-A-C-K-L-E at Baylor dot E-D-U or Lynn dot Gackle at Gmail. Dr. Gackle, we have time for one more question. Okay, sure. so my question is uh, when you're working with the younger uh, junior high age uh, female voices and they have the breathiness in the voice mm -hmm. and some of that will go away with time and some of that goes away with uh, practice and training you were talking about uh, what warm-ups and vocalies do you have and how much should we as teachers be stressing the connection of the voice and the, and the getting rid of the breathiness and how much should we just let it happen naturally should we should we push them on that I guess is what I'm asking 
I think I think what we what we push, if you want to use that word, um, you know, Ken Phillips wrote a, wrote a great book uh, in 1992 called Teaching Kids to Sing, and it, it applies to, to all kids. And, and it's it, the key is breath management. It's learning how to take the breath and manage the breath. A lot of times they'll take the breath and they'll go, ah. Number one, I would never use an ah vowel. That's one of the hardest vowels to sing because it's so open. An oo vowel, however, it encourages sympathetic resonation. They can feel that. It also lifts the soft palate. So I can have them take that breath. And one way to do that, if they don't know how, is to put the hands behind the head or put one behind, one hand there and, I don't know if you can see me, one hand here, and then have them breathe into their, breathe into their hands right here and encourage that lower diaphragmatic breath and then have them go and then decrescendo and then from the sibilant sound start from the u go to the e then to the other vowels and then the placement of each vowel hangs in that lifted space, if that makes sense. That alone takes care of so much breathiness. I think it has to be reinforced constantly in almost every warm up. Um, I do a wee, 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 wee. They'll go wee, 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 wee. I don't allow that. <laughs> you just gotta say, okay, we're gonna put, put your fingers right here. I don't want fish lips. I'm not asking for that. The other recognition is that when we say e o, if they to put their hands like this, say e e o o e o e o e o e o. What moves? The tongue. And a lot of times they don't understand that vowels are really made inside the mouth as much as outside of the mouth. So I guess my answer to you is making young people understand how can they transfer that which they don't understand. Making them cognizant of what it feels like to take the breath, what it feels like to exhale the breath and maintain the ribs out and let the abdominal muscles do the work. In other words, singing is a psychomotor function. And I don't think we have to go into diagrams and all that, but you need to say, what does that feel like? And by f giving them that type of feedback, which was harder, to get loud or to get soft? Invariably, they're going to say to get soft is harder. Newsflash, it takes more energy to sing soft than it does loud. And so all of these things, we're getting them to understand about muscle balance. The brain is telling them what to do, how to do it. And I think our warm-ups have to reinforce that constantly. I start every warm-up with a lip trill and, with, a, and, and with, with junior high kids, I'd go through that process of taking the breath, exhaling the breath. Taking the breath, eight counts, eight counts soft. Ten counts, ten counts soft. Phonation duration. Because that crescendo, decrescendo is the basis for what? Phrase. And if they don't, you can say phrase all you want, but if they don't know how the breath works to create phrase, how can they transfer that? Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Dr. Gackle, that is all the time we have for you today. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you. My pleasure. I appreciate it.